disseminating these kind of uh, in, uh, programs that, that will better the lives of people. We look forward to uh, continuing our work. I just say thank you, Sam, for uh, hosting this and for inviting us. Thank you. Thank you, Blair. Our next speaker is from Finland, Mr. Petri Peltonen. He's the Director General, Ministry of Employment and Economy. Thank you very much, Dr. Pitrodo. Dear friends and uh, colleagues of innovation from India and abroad, um, I already had the pleasure of participating in the first Global Innovation Roundtable here in Delhi uh, a year ago, and I certainly gladly accepted the invitation to <coughs> To the second forum here. I think this is truly a, uh, a uh, energetic global forum for exchanging views on, on the word that really unites the world in many ways, the word of innovation. It gets to be mentioned often. Uh, it's also true in Finland. Um, and incidentally, still, it, though it gets a lot of attention, there's not really a precise definition for innovation. We uh, sort of ideally speak about innovation without a sort of a clear cut definition of what, what it is. The Finnish sort of thinking, or at least my personal view on innovation, is reasonably pragmatic. It is the process of putting knowledge, skills, and creativity into a novel and really practical use. So in that sense, putting uh, uh, really knowledge, skills, and creativity into a uh, use and uh, with significance, I think it's really the essence of innovation. And also, it means that innovation is not an objective as its own. It's a means to achieve higher ends. And in that sense, obviously, competitiveness, be that at the level of companies or, or na nations, renewal, and, and pushing for, for uh, jobs and growth are clearly the, uh, the drivers. But it's not only an economic issue. It's very much also a way to transform the society and, and uh, provide better service, be that in education, health, or many other uh, facets of life. So in that sense, in many ways, innovation is a broad concept. It's not only science push. It is very much also uh, the other sort of a dimensions, uh, be that then social innovations, uh, workplace innovations, or even transforming, of course, uh, uh, business uh, models, uh, not only through uh, technology. Uh, well, clearly, this uh, uh, Global Innovation Roundtable is a sort of a platform for us to learn from one another. And clearly, I think it is also an opportunity for us to learn from India. So in that sense, I think really the key features of Indian innovation policy Inclusivity, accessibility, sustainability, and scalability are, are really drivers that should be sort of reflected in, uh, in modern innovation policies, be that in India or in Finland or, or in many other uh, parts of the world. Clearly, India has got the, some of the top uh, science institutions uh, here in the country that really belong to the global top. And, uh, and clearly, there's a sort of strong willingness and desire to put the science into use. Uh, through innovation. So in that sense, very uh, clearly, the user orientation, the uh, sort of uh, openness of innovation and the innovation processes, the crowd sourcing a, a sort of a concepts are very sort of Indian features of innovation as well, which I think are truly areas which we also try to implement in the Finnish policy making and, and, and on wider scales. So uh, a few words on the Finnish uh, sort of uh, uh, innovation policy uh, and agenda. Clearly, Finland is some, one of the uh, reasonably advanced innovation nations. And if I were to sort of uh, choose one word to describe the Finnish sort of innovation policy or the Finnish innovation uh, uh, mechanisms, I would really opt for the word partnerships. I think a partnership is truly one of the words that describe innovation uh, in, in many ways. It's industry, academia, partnerships. It's national, regional, international, uh, cross-border uh, 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 partnerships. And it's really the will willingness to share and learn from one another. Um, the innovation is really driving the Finnish government uh, agenda strongly. Uh, actually, uh, we have a reasonably new government in office. And in the 50-page government agenda document, the program document, there's 26 mentionings uh, of the word uh, 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 innovation. So it really means that innovation is not only mentioned in the paragraph on innovation policy. It's really truly rooted in the economic policy, into energy, into health, into educational policy. So it's very much a cross-cutting issue uh, in, in Finland as well. And of course, innovation is long-term policy. And in Finland, clearly, we have a sort of a 
strong commitment by the government on investing on research and development already for decades, at least for over the first uh, th 30 de uh, three last decades, 30 years or so. And Finland, alongside with Sweden, uh, is, is one of those countries that is, is investing significantly also the, from the government budgets on innovation. About 1% of the GDP of Finland actually uh, is as the government share of the uh, investments. And of course, over two thirds then come from the private sector, the companies themselves. And of course, another element of the driving innovation is, is education uh, policies. And, and the tradition in Finland is really obviously very long term in investing on the broad uh, accessibility to education, because we do believe it's not only the policies and programs, it's the, it's the people and their skills that are really the essence of, of innovation policy. So in that sense, a long term commitment on, uh, on innovation policy, or, and it's especially ed education policies, has been one of the sort of a cornerstones of, of the Finnish innovation thinking. Uh, very briefly on the uh, Finland-India Science and Technology Corporation, I'm glad to say that we had a sort of a Finland-India bilateral consultation on our uh, intergovernmental agreement uh, three weeks ago in Helsinki. Uh, and clearly India is, uh, after the EU collaboration, among the top three global partners that we do have in science and, and collaboration. And in Finnish terms, we're talking about significant funding. About 10 million euro per year is invested on, on bilateral programs from the Finnish side together with our Indian colleagues. So our funding agencies, TECES and the Academy of Finland, are, are having active joint calls with their Indian partners, Department of Biotechnology and Department of Science and Technology. So in that sense, we do have concrete uh, uh, sort of a bilateral activities. And Finland has been also actively pushing for the EU agenda. So we should really also uh, strive for policies that connect India and the European Union uh, uh, sort of a more strongly together. So in that sense, uh, the efforts that are now being taken by the Commission have been strongly uh, supported and pushed by, by Finland in making sure that, for example, the European Union research programs, the so-called Horizon program, will have truly a global access to the key partners in India and, uh, and, uh, and other parts of the world. So ladies and gentlemen, we're suddenly delighted from the Finnish perspective to join the conference. We do have a sort of a, a permanent representation of the Finnish innovation uh, system here in, uh, in India called FinNode. It's the Finland Innovation Center here in, in Delhi that was inaugurated a, a year and a half ago with, by my minister, Mr. Hakamirs. At, at the inaugural um, ceremony, the uh, Indian government, government minister, Dr. Sibal, actually gave a diligent speech, and I still do re recall uh, the, his concluding words, where he basically uh, challenged uh, all of us to innovate in the way we think. And I think that's truly very much uh, sort of a message to our uh, global innovation forum as well. We should all innovate in the way we think. Thank you very much. Thank you. We have a little change in the sequence, one because of some flight delays and two because of some scheduling issues. So I'm going to request now Sarah Wilson from Canada, Minister Commercial and Senior Trade Commissioner, High Commission of Canada. Sarah. Thank you very much and, and thank you for accommodating our um, uh, scheduling challenges uh, and also the the flight delays. Um, very very happy to be here and uh, and uh, would like to pass on the regrets of High Commissioner Stuart Beck. Uh, we have our Prime Minister coming next week. I think uh, that's been reported in the news rather widely. So uh, you can imagine that uh, that freeing up people's time to be here uh, is a bit of a challenge. But uh, but it's really important to be part of this dialogue and and to be part of such a distinguished uh, group. And and I'm very honored uh, that we are included in this. Um, I think it's I important to be able to talk about Canada's role in in the innovation community that's out there. Um, and we're seeing an increasing engagement on this, particularly here in India, with a number of, of MOUs and active partnerships across many sectors, such as agriculture and uh, ICT, aerospace, mining, many, many more areas. Um, and we've really changed the way we've approached S&T and innovation over the years and how we engage on that front around the world um, in that process as well. 
with better connections between, uh, and I think uh, my, my colleague Mr. Hall spoke about this as well, between industry and academia um, and investors. And that's kind of, you know, those three together really make up um, the community in, in Canada and many parts of the world. And I think it should not be Canada-centric, and I think, you know, everybody's been talking about that, and that's the point of this dialogue and, and this global um, sort of uh, in, round table, that everybody is part of this, because if you really do see knowledge as the light, um, you know, sharing that doesn't diminish it, right? It, it strengthens, it, it has the opposite effect, and so that's really important, and I think the, the sort of message here. Uh, Canada's innovation strengths, I, I think they really hinge on our international engagement and, and that's, what, that's what I've been saying. Um, we're a small country, uh, we're a large country, but we're a really small country in terms of population. We have vast and diverse and challenging geography and fortunately we're situated next to the U.S. Um, that challenges us in a number of ways. It also provides a lot of benefits and opportunities for, uh, for us and for our companies. Um, and so when you think about how our companies, uh, a lot of them deal, and I look to, uh, to our, uh, one of our representatives of one of our uh, best and most innovative companies, OpenText, uh, I think that we, we talk about this 595 uh, kind of thing because a lot of our companies don't have the market domestically in Canada to, uh, to take their ideas or their products or services to the next level. We have to, we only get about 5% of that bang at home. We have to go outside of our country to get the, re the rest of it, the other 95. So we always talk about this kind of 595 uh, concept. But um, just talking about the, the strength in innovation, we have um, a highly competitive tax incentive and, and people have talked about the importance of that. We have one of the most generous tax-based support programs in the industrialized world through the science, Scientific Research and Experimental Development, SR&ED tax credit. And there are upcoming changes to that program which will make it even more responsive uh, to the needs of the innovation-driven businesses, uh, the vast majority of which are SMEs. Our technology cr clusters across Canada range from hydrogen fuel cells in Vancouver to aerospace in Montreal to ocean technology in St. John's, Newfoundland. Uh, very diverse, um, but you can see that they make a lot of sense based on the geography and the location where, where you can find these folks. Um, Canada's S&T reputation, uh, just a word about that. In September 2012, the Council of Canadian Academies released a uh, an, an, an expert panel assessment on the state of S&T in Canada. This is a bit of inward looking um, sort of self-assessment, but we also uh, took a survey with the international community to see sort of how we're viewed and what people think of, of how we're um, performing on that front and to take ideas from that. 68% of respondents characterize Canada's international reputation as strong um, and we're seen to be very good collaborators. Again, we need to be. This isn't a, an option for us. Our priorities. Of course our priorities are, are themes that make sense for Canada and for Canadians in our current situation, um, in, our, in our geography, in our environment, uh, with the oil sands and, and the focus on developing that natural resource, uh, among others, with the Arctic, with an aging population, and with a need to uh, provide connectivity networks uh, for a, a diverse and scattered population. They speak to our needs, uh, but they also speak to needs that resonate in many other parts of the country um, or parts of the world. And so we can see, you know, may not make sense for everybody to talk about issues with the Arctic, but it certainly makes sense for Canada to talk about issues with the Arctic with other uh, communities that have uh, some sort of a, a connection to the Arctic. Um, Ultimately, what, what's happening up there is important to us all, um, as global warming will uh, have an impact on the whole world. Um, in terms of the federal S&T landscape, uh, it's a decentralized system through 12 major science-based departments in our country. Um, our federal government support uh, goes out to these groups. That the, there's a lot of acronyms up there on the slide. Uh, but the largest is the Natural Science and Engineering Research Council. Uh, and the second is the Canada Institute of Health Research. Again, you can see where the focus is on, on what, we're, what we're trying to do. 
uh, in terms of government support. Nearly two-thirds of the funding in 2011 went to R&D, while the remaining 36-37% uh, was allocated towards scientific activities, including data collection, special services and studies, and information services and others. So you can see the third bar there is uh, Statistics Canada. Uh, obviously, they're in the, in the service and data collection uh, sort of uh, uh, line of work, um, whereas the others are, are sort of more focused on R&D. Again, in the federal S&T landscape, I, I was mentioning uh, three agencies, which are called the, the Tri-Council, serve as the major source of federal funding for research and scholarship in academic institutions. So the Canadian Institute of Health Research focuses on biomedical, clinical, health system services, social, cultural, environmental, and population health. Uh, the Natural Science uh, and Engineering Research Council, known as NSERC, uh, funds basic research, supports partnerships between post-secondary institutions and industry, as I was talking about that collaboration being very important, and offers scholarships and grants for students and researchers in the area of natural science and engineering. Uh, the third one is the Social Science and Humanities Research Council. This promotes and supports post-secondary based research, training, knowledge, mobilization, and partnerships in the humanities and social sciences. Now, turning to industry and the corporate uh, science and technology landscape, you can see that top 100 corporate R&D spenders are in these uh, six or seven industries focused and concentrated there. I think, Sam, you were saying, you know, uh, the, the tendency is to go towards IT, uh, ICT, uh, communications, uh, infotech, and, and that sort of uh, area, and that's where it's concentrated. And it does make some sense there, but we need to look at the others as well. Uh, one of our top companies is, is here, as I mentioned, uh, to participate, and, and you'll be hearing from Mui Madzoub uh, later today, uh, and, uh, and I believe that uh, he's speaking on behalf of Tom Jenkins, who was affected by the, uh, the weather in, uh, in the um, northeast United States uh, and unable to, uh, to make it here today, but I understand he's coming next week, which will be great to have him here. Um, my colleague, again, from the U.S. spoke of the fundamental role of the private sector in innovation and commercialization of new technologies. This is also true in Canada. And I would like to note also that the studies have shown the absolutely critical role that entrepreneurs play in that, in job creation and in economic growth and development. So it's really the entrepreneurs that we need to focus on. Turning to the academic landscape, Many of these universities uh, and institutions you see here are uh, very active here in India and, and around the world globally. Um, and you can you know, see many of these uh, sort of uh, uh, networks also collaborate together um, and, and with groups of institutions in various locations. And I think what we're trying to do is, is get that more globalized as opposed to even on a bilateral basis. I think just working with more partners will only make us stronger in that regard. Looking forward, we have a long history of S&T cooperation with India. We have a strong foundation on which to build moving forward, and we're planning uh, for a, a joint S&T committee meeting uh, to be held here in India in the new year. We hope to take our collaboration there to the next level. Um, our established uh, S&T system in combination with India's rapidly growing technological capabilities has the potential for producing leading edge collaborative research, research that would be mutually beneficial to both countries. Our strong bilateral relationship also plays an important role in our ongoing comprehensive economic partnership agreement negotiations um, as science, innovation and technology are critically important to the economic prosperity of both countries. We support strengthening science, technology, and innovation collaboration with India to accelerate the commercialization of new technologies, to encourage fundamental research, foster the creation of high-quality jobs, and bolster diplomatic relations. Canada supports strengthening science, technology, and innovation collaboration here and also around the world, and we see great potential in science and tech collaboration with India given the importance of innovation to economic and social prosperity in both countries. 
we were very pleased to ratify the Canada-India Science and Technology Agreement in 2005, and we look forward to that meeting in January, where we will look at joint efforts, uh, areas where we can strengthen uh, our engagement there, particularly in biotechnology, life sciences, sustainable and alternative energies, environmental technology, information communication technology, and in <coughs> aerospace. I'll stop here, but more than all of this, I think it really makes sense for Canada and India to work together. We face many similar challenges um, in a large and diverse population with a vast and a varied geography, posing difficulties in providing high quality services and education uh, and health care and connectivity to people, especially those in remote communities. I think we have a lot to learn from India and others around the world, and I think we have a lot to share. So I'll, I'll stop there, but I know that we're going to have colleagues uh, staying on for the couple of days, uh, and we're really uh, grateful for the opportunity to participate and look forward to the discussion, and I particularly look forward to your Twitter debate. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Our next speaker is Dr. Lachnan Strawn, Deputy High Commissioner from Australia. Dr. Strawn. Thank you very much, Sam. It's a pleasure to be here. I've been in India for four years, and um, last year we had Dr. Don Russell, the head of our Department of Innovation here. Unfortunately, um, Dr. Russell is caught up on other business in Australia. One week ago, our Prime Minister, Julia Gillard, released a major white paper called Australia in the Asian Century. This white paper recognises the shift in political and economic weight towards the, what we now call the Indo-Pacific region. That is our own region, a region in which we are now very deeply embedded. This white paper considers how Australia will navigate the years ahead of us in five key areas. The paper looks at how we will strengthen our economy, how we will build our capabilities, how we will connect to growing markets, how we will ensure sustainable security, and how we will nurture deeper and broader relationships. Running through the paper, which is, I think, very much animated by a sense of opportunity, but also by a sense of urgency, is a recognition that in a globalised world, the need to innovate is absolutely critical. Our own economy is undergoing considerable structural change and is now moving at several different speeds. So the need to innovate, to find new ways of doing things and to create new jobs for our young people remains critical. So reform and investment run right through the white paper and the plan that we have for the future. A key part of this is very much how do we maintain and increase productivity. The elements of driving higher productivity are very much about skills and education, infrastructure, tax and regulatory reform, and broadly innovation. And our Finnish colleague, I think, best captured what innovation is about. It's a, a word that we all kind of know, but to some extent it has a slightly amorphous feeling about it. We are very much about forging stronger research links between our industries, between our businesses and our research sector. We have the aim of aspiring to push Australia into the top 10 innovation nations by 2025. We are developing a national research investment plan. This will set a framework for government investment in science and research capacity. As our American colleague mentioned, in the end, you need a very strong partnership between government and business. So it's absolutely critical that our firms develop new business models and new mindsets. We find that our businesses which innovate are twice as likely to boost productivity. We have seen over the past year a quite unprecedented surge in our business expenditure in research and development, but that level of expenditure, frankly, still remains not what we'd like it to be. We have a strong history of innovation. For instance, Wi-Fi, it's not widely known, is in fact an Australian invention. Cancer vaccine. And in just in the last couple of months, we've made a major step forward in developing a vaccination nano patch, which will mean that our children no longer have to fear getting an injection for a vaccination, but instead a nano patch can be used. 
and a small startup company has developed a way of a way of scaling up this technology and making it accessible. Also in August we developed the first bionic eye. So it's critical that we drive commercialization of innovation. Since 2010 we have, have a body in place called Commercialization Australia. Its job is to assist our, especially our small and medium sized enterprises in their innovation efforts. Through this program we have dispersed $100 million in grants. A much more important policy innovation for us has been our Clean Energy Future Initiative. <laughs> this is where our government has introduced a carbon price and we have done that to reshape the economy, to drive innovation and to cut pollution. Under this carbon pricing scheme, our top 500 polluters will shortly be paying a price for carbon. We are also establishing a clean energy finance corporation to invest money over the next 10 years in driving cleaner energy. So we see this kind of major development in our energy policy as a way of driving innovation across the economy. If we look forward, I think there are several challenges before us. One is to make sure that we harness innovation in a way in which ensures that our innovation efforts are dealing with the big public policy issues. This is climate change, health, aging population, and as I said earlier, maintaining productivity. Now, of course, this is increasingly difficult in a time of tight budgets. Secondly, the major challenge for us is improving collaboration, both domestically and internationally. Our largest science research fund anywhere in the world is with India. We have invested $64 million in this program over the last five years. It dwarfs what we do with any other international partner. Our Prime Minister was here two weeks ago and she visited some of the projects which are being funded under this program and they're doing very core things to meet everyday needs of people across the world. For instance, one project is fighting malaria. Beyond the Science Research Fund, we have a lot of good work being done by other scientists, including in the affordable eye care field. Some of our leading ophthalmologists are working in India on developing an eye care model which can be deployed in rural and urban areas and scaled up to meet the needs of ordinary people. So we need more collaboration domestically, internationally. We need more collaboration inside industry and between industry and our research sector. The third challenge we see is improving what we would call the innovation dividend. And that is proving to our population that publicly funded research is worth it. In a day and age where budgets are under such pressure, you need to be able to prove that the research is delivering commercial, economic and social benefits. Very much linked to that, fourthly, is strengthening our firms and making them more what we call innovation active. We're doing this by supplying early stage capital, assisting them in their skill development and their innovation ca capabilities and implementing a major mentoring program. Again, I must say that the global financial crisis has put enormous pressure on this kind of program. We find that confidence has been sapped and the availability of capital, as we all know, is much more scarce. The fifth challenge is very much about um, access and equity. And this is what we um, would call the importance of social innovation. We, for instance, have created an Australian Centre for Social Innovation. This is an independent, non-profit organisation which uses government seed funding to develop innovation at the very grassroots level. This is very much then about addressing unmet social needs and it brings together design, social science, community development and businesses. I'll give you one example of the kind of project which we are now funding. In the southern state of Victoria, we have our first community-owned wind farm. This is a multi-stakeholder community which brings together the local community, businesses, scientists with government funding. The cooperative manages the wind farm, it then provides a financial t return to its members, and it in turn funds community projects through a community sustainability fund. 
So I'd like to end at this point on the note, that indeed, Sam, as you mentioned, it's critical that our innovation policies reach out broadly and become accessible to people at all levels of society. And in fact, our innovation efforts and the political debate will become more difficult to manage if we don't be inclusive and accessible. Thank you. Our next speaker is from Netherlands, Dr. Linsen. He's the Deputy Director for Innovations and Knowledge, Ministry of Economic Affairs, Agriculture and Innovations. Welcome. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Petroda, ministers, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. It's a great honor to me to represent the Netherlands in this new leading global forum on, on innovation. In my elevator pitch, from the Dutch perspective, I will present a simple message. And because it is simple, I expect to use not more than a few minutes. The Netherlands, in size ranking 133rd, and in population ranking uh, 61st, but fifth on the Global Competitiveness Index, likes to see itself modestly as a medium-sized economic power. Not so much the leading world power that ruled the waves, well, some waves in the 17th century, our so-called uh, Golden Age. But still, as it was in those times, we are a very open, very open economy, depending on its foreign trade. Nowadays, even for more than 60% of gross domestic product. And as you all know, like all developed economies, we are depending on innovation for 60% of our economic growth. So especially in these difficult economic times, innovation is very important. My first issue is that we globally face enormous societal challenges. The climate change is a very important one. Health, security, and aging population are other societal challenges. The only way to tackle them is by innovation. For example, the control of the water system is very important to tackle the consequences of the changing climate. Societal challenges are the engines for future growth. If we innovate our dikes and water waste management, new products can be exported and new cooperation can be established. Markets of tomorrow ask for technology of tomorrow. Technology of tomorrow originates from today's knowledge combined with strategic vision about tomorrow's opportunities. And concerning the strategic vision, I think we have something to offer and we can learn a lot from other countries such as India. We surely are willing to learn from each other. My second issue is that we face a changing international balance of power, bringing growing international competition and also the economic and political rise of upcoming markets in Asia, Latin America and Africa. For an innovative trading country like the Netherlands, this is by no means a threat but an immense opportunity. We may be a very open economy, but less than 20% of our exports as yet goes to the aforementioned upcoming markets. Still the largest part of our exports goes to European countries like Germany and the UK. Here our great challenges lie. Here also our governments play important roles in freeing markets in opening borders where we can, uh, be it bilaterally or multilaterally, to reduce the red tape and to cooperate with other countries such as India. We consider globalization a win-win game. And now I come to the essence of my message. According to the Dutch government, this is the model to combine competition and cooperation the golden triangle of innovation and trade. In our Dutch innovation system, this triangle was invented some 30 years ago. We found out it works. 
business enterprise plays a crucial role. They have to bring the innovation to the market. Knowledge institutions comprises the development of fundamental knowledge and of applied knowledge. Issues of fundamental knowledge and of applied knowledge have to be brought together. The government facilitates, brings the other parties together and has a special role concerning the formulation of the societal challenges. These three parties form the golden triangle. This model is the essence of our so-called top sector policy. And the top sector policy means that we use this model in our main innovative areas such as agro-food, energy, high-tech, water, chemistry and logistics. I will come back on the top sector policy tomorrow. The golden triangle, the golden triangle is not easy, but it definitely is necessary. It is also the answer to the development of innovation itself, which becomes more and more open. But we are not ready yet. The next thing we must do is to create international innovation cooperation. We want to join forces. I would say invent the golden wheel of international innovation cooperation. This global round table, this new wheel of innovation, is a significant contribution to that. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Our next speaker is Ms. Liz Grande, President Coordinator for the United Nations. Dr. Petroda, thank you very much. Um, the UN would like to pick up on a point that you raised at the beginning in your introductory comments, asking us to focus how innovation can help the people at the bottom. And specifically, what I would like to do is share a few words about how important innovation has been in reaching the Millennium Development Goals. As I think everyone is probably aware, three years from now, the global deadline for achieving these eight goals will expire. If we don't innovate our way to success and hurry up doing it, a very great opportunity to achieve something really important internationally will have been missed. The global scorecard on the MDGs is better than we might have feared, but certainly not what we would have hoped for. The good news is that the global target of cutting in half the proportion of people living on less than $1.25 a day has been met in 2010. Other good news is that the targets for expanding access to improved sources of water and significantly improving the lives of at least 100 million slum dwellers around the world have also been met. And very impressively, global malaria deaths have declined by a third, and many countries have achieved near parity in primary education between boys and girls. So globally, that's the good news. <coughs> The worrying news, and again picking up on a point that Dr. Petroda made, is that inequalities are not budging. Also, recent natural disasters and the global financial crisis have slowed progress across the board. Unfortunately, vulnerable employment, which is defined as the share of unpaid family workers and own account workers in total employment, has not decreased at all. And hunger remains a global challenge. 850 million people in the world are living with hunger. That's 15% of the entire population. And very worryingly, child undernutrition remains just an enormous problem. For example, nearly a third of children in South Asia are estimated to be underweight. The UN, however, believes that if we innovate and work hard, we can turn the bad news to good news, and it can be done in three years. We would like to share with you why we are bullish and optimistic about the impact that innovation can have on reaching the people at the bottom and improving their lives very quickly. We want to take a couple of examples. My favorite example of innovation as it relates to the MDGs is the scale up use of insecticide treated bed nets to reduce malaria and I'm going to take the example of Ethiopia. In 2004, 5% of the population in Ethiopia 
owned and used a bed net. The government launched a major, massive bed net redistribution program, and it was supported by the Global Fund, the World Bank, and the U.S. President's Malaria Initiative. The aim was to make sure that every household in a malaria risk area had two long-lasting insecticide-treated bed nets. 20 million bed nets were distributed within two years, two years. The number of childhood malaria cases plummeted by 60% and the death rate was halved. I mean, just incredible. My second favorite example of innovation with the MDGs is the way that generic drugs have dramatically extended the lives of people living with HIV AIDS. There are two parts to this story. First, and we need to give credit to the pharmaceutical companies for this, some of the forward-looking ones found ways of combining complex HIV regimens into simpler formulas. This means that rather than having to take a lot of pills several times a day, someone living with HIV AIDS now needs only to take one or two pills a day once or twice daily. This has made it so much easier for people who are living in difficult and impoverished circumstances to adhere to their treatment regimes, and this in turn has had a dramatic impact on extending their lives. The second part of the story, the more dramatic part of the story, is the enormous drop in the price of life-saving drugs. The Clinton Foundation, the World Health Organization, and the Global Fund encourage drug companies, I'm not gonna say push them, to lower costs to affordable levels by guaranteed large volume procurement. This was backed by governments like India, which helped to create conducive policy environments so that generic equivalents could be made available to countries across the globe. As a result of this innovation, the cost of first-line ARV treatment dropped from a staggering ten to $15,000 per year per patient to $116 per patient per year. Went from $15,000 a year to 116. This in turn has meant that six and a half million people are actively under treatment for HIV AIDS. This was inconceivable when the cost of that treatment was $15,000 a year. A third great example of innovation and how it has improved the lives of the bottom is the use of mobile phones for all kinds of financial and social programs. Of course, there are seven billion people in the world, five billion using mobile phones. Even more interestingly, according to the UN, two out of three mobile phone users live in the developing world. The UN estimates that half of everybody living in remote areas on the planet is, are going to have mobile phones by this year, by 2012. The possibilities that are opened by these facts are truly incredible, just two. More than 100 countries are now, 100, are exploring the use of mobile phones to improve health care. For example, by referring people to their nearest health care facility. In Kenya, Safaricom, private company, launched a mobile phone-based payment and money transfer service, which allows microfinance borrowers to conveniently receive and repay loans using the network of Safaricom airtime resellers. Users can deposit money into accounts stored on their cell phone, send balances using SMS technology to other users, and then redeem the deposits for regular money. I mean, this kind of innovation is simply changing the lives of people who don't have access to formal financial and banking systems. And finally, because I'm the head of the UN in India, I'd like to share a story about innovation here in India that the UN had the privilege of being a part of. It's called Solution Exchange. Solution Exchange is an online knowledge management system which was introduced by the UN family under the leadership of the government several years ago. Currently, there are 28,000 practitioners and experts who use this system. They exchange knowledge and experience, they share and discuss development and MDG innovations from the field and a policy level. This innovation is now expanding throughout the region and the world. It's being rolled out in Bangladesh, Bhutan, the Pacific Islands, and Russia has just taken it up. 
since the un aspires to be a normative institution that helps to share good practice and knowledge across the world i hope you'll allow me to share just a few lessons that the un has learned about innovations and mdgs i'd like to pick on on a point that mr hall made from the u.s embassy when he said that the government is crucial the experience that the un sees around the world is that there's no question there has to be government ownership since only governments have the capacity to legislate, implement policy, and finance national programs. That is not to diminish the role of the private sector, and certainly for sustainability, the private sector and civil society are crucial. But we cannot underestimate, nor in any way reduce the influence and importance of the government in pushing forward innovations. The second thing that the UN has learned is that implementation is everything. It is as important, if not more so, than the initial big idea and design. It's more important than the initial big idea and design. Balance has to be struck between sustained support on the one hand and flexibility on the other. And then again, another point that Mr. Hall raised. This is just key. You know, failure, we have to recognize, is not only possible, but it's got to be tolerated. Of course, working for the UN, you might appreciate why I would raise this point. I'd like to share with you a story about Rwanda. For many years, I worked in Central Africa. And, you know, we were looking at this incredible experiment in progress that Rwanda had, also with bed nets. In one year, you probably have heard the story, Rwanda cut malaria incidents by 66%. Took them one year. It was even more impressive than Ethiopia. They did one thing. They saturated the country with bed nets. Everybody got bed nets in Rwanda. And, really importantly, they got them all at once, stopping the transmission vector of the disease. Okay, so I had an opportunity, I was privileged to meet with the director of that program. And I asked him, you know, how'd you guys do it? And this is what he said to me, I've never forgotten this. He said, I'll tell you the truth. We failed at everything we tried for years in this domain. We tried everything to stop malaria, but we kept going. And when we finally got it right, boy, did we get it right. Of course, the moral of that story is that innovations require a tolerance for failure, which can only come about if there is a level of organizational maturity for a failure is seen as an opportunity to learn and grow. Okay, so to summarize, on a positive note, there are only a couple more years left to live up to a promise that the international community made to itself in 2000 that we were gonna do everything possible to reach eight simple goals by 2015. Innovations in governance, products, processes, and services have been decisive in the past 12 years, some of the examples we've shared with you, to reach those goals. And that's why we believe in the UN that in the final stages of this campaign, the last three years, that adaptation and innovation are more important than ever. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know what I say after that. <laughs> Thanks, Liz. Really appreciate your energy and enthusiasm. I think we are at the end of the la first session. I want to thank all our speakers. A couple of speakers had some flight scheduling problems, so they are not here. But I'll take a few minutes to sort of comment, and if you have some comments maybe we can open up for discussions for a while we are little we still have about 5 10 minutes first of all i'm glad that we had this chance to hear different views from different countries this definitely sets the stage for detailed discussions later this afternoon on funding on issues like crowdsourcing and others and I hope we have the same interest and momentum on these topics as well. I was told to talk about this little bit, and I forgot, so I can use this couple of minutes to talk. You know, India has developed this little tablet for schools. And we are told that this is going to be available for around $50 to school children. It is open source software, Android operating system, 
and we have colleagues here from Google who will talk a little more about other issues related to these kinds of technologies. And there is no reason why this is not applicable in other countries in Africa, Latin America and other places. This is really productive if you can put all your learning material on this today. So kids don't have to carry 17 pounds of bag with books. I see these little kids on the street here in Delhi, you know, pretty weak, but carry, carrying, you know, 18, 19 pounds of bag in the back. The idea is not to just have this kind of a device, but also have applications, software, content, local language, all of that packaged properly at the back end to make this more productive. And there is just a lot of work in this area. I had a very interesting meeting with a couple of friends from Google yesterday. And they educated at least me and some of my colleagues on the kind of work they are trying to do related to how Indians access internet. And they have some very interesting observations. They say Indians are very different compared to any other place they have seen in our access to internet. And they are trying to design some new technology just to meet Indian needs. Fascinating conversation. We have him here, young um, managing director of Google. And I told him, I said, I want to learn a lot from you. It is that generation that's going to change the paradigm. They have very different way of looking at things than my generation had. So I'm sure we'll get a lot of younger people to tell us a little more about how these kinds of things can be used. Maybe we can open up for some few comments before I close this session. If you have some comments, if not, we can bake up for tea. Comments? Yes, sir. Uh, Sam, you mentioned that Indians use the internet differently. Could, could you tell us how? I would have the Google gentleman tell us a little bit. Can you just spend a couple of minutes? Hi. Um, <clears throat> so there is one primary distinction. Is that clear? Yeah, there is uh, one uh, thing that I think is worth noting. Um, India has 500 million people who buy and read newspapers. <coughs> and that's about the level of literacy that is there in the country. Um, but the number of people who are fluent in any language, not just English, is less than 100 million people. And uh, the other 400 million people have the literacy level of a 7 to 10 year old notwithstanding how many people were graduating from 10 to 12 then college and so on. And uh, so you have adults who are using the internet like a seven year old would, uh, which makes it very interesting. And uh, the simple way to think about it is the internet is a very new technology for the average person in India. Um, and you have literacy challenges and you have content challenges. So all of these three uh, converge to a very simple inflection point where the internet for the average Indian really means Bollywood on their phone. <coughs> and it's not a bad start because Bollywood is very easy to explain. The internet is impossible to explain. Um, let me give you a very simple example. We have this cafe called the Goo Cafe um, in our office in Bangalore in our R&D center. It's outside our firewall. It's open to everybody. So the drivers and maids who work in that building come up and use the internet when they are free and of course if you have drivers in India they are free most of the time because they are working and uh, and they and a bunch of them used the internet for about six months and then came back and said why did you not tell us it was this and uh, and by that time they had become bloggers they had started to use the internet to actually find jobs and so on and so forth um, and some of them even bought computers for the kids with their income um, and then you know I asked one of them look I've been trying to figure out how to message this to everybody like you, and I cannot. So can you explain me what this means? And they could not explain. So it is one of those things that has to be experienced before they get used to it. Um, and we cannot think of a better way 
than you know Bollywood to get them used to the internet, um, and uh, and it, it follows the parallel that we fo we followed in the U.S. I happened to be in the U.S. when the internet started taking off in my grad school in the early 90s, and uh, I was telling Sam that uh, I was sitting on the Carnegie Mellon backbone and we were analyzing what people were using the internet for in the early 90s. Um, and those of you who are old enough to remember this, uh, most of the internet in those days was porn. And it started with that and then moved to fun stuff and then moved to the academic community, then moved to things like Amazon and Yahoo and so on. So India is following this path from entertainment, highly visual, because uh, there is this inflection point. We have done some cognitive psychology studies which tell us that there is an inflection point around the age of 10 to 12 for kids, which happened to all of us, where we can get an emotional response by reading. And this has not happened to the average person in the world. So their internet, by definition, has to be visual because visual is how they get their emotional response. That's how they learn. Bottom line is, I want him to go to work. <laughs> okay. I want him to do things for us that nobody else can think of doing. So, you know, we need people like him to look at things differently because some of us are locked up in one way of looking at it. So with this one, maybe you want to say a few words? Okay. I think it was a fantastic uh, presentation list from you <laughs> and several of you. Uh, I had a long back prior commitment, so I won't be here. So I thought one comment I want to make that uh, you mentioned about the HIV drug, but that HIV drug needed combination of two. And innovative scientists who brought the cost down, that happened to be one of my CSI laboratories, and then the Hamid of CIPLA who could join hand. So therefore, it is this partnership which is critical to create those ultra-low affordable costs. And that is what is the very, very critical part. I don't think we should miss that uh, in the innovation chain. That, that is the ultimate. And the uh, last point I want to just say on the Google comment, uh, there is an XPRIZE foundation which wanted to genome sequencing of 100, 100 years old individuals across the world. And you know, it was taking time for various parts of the world to collect, and USA is the major uh, initiative. It's, it's a $10 million award. Whoever will be able to do sequencing 100 human genome in 30 days with 99, you know, with one in a million error, uh, with an accuracy of 99%, okay? Uh, you're finished. And to get consent and all, so we just came up with a simple idea. We just connected a couple of doctors whose Facebook, and within 48 hours, we got, uh, we wanted all children of doctors and their parents and grandparents so that we don't have difficulties in explaining anything. And it is less than 48 hours we got all the volunteers we needed from India. So this is the power of a new technology of doing things which should have taken months in any other way. I thought I'd just bring this uh, little innovation that we just did this week uh, in CSIR, so I just thought I'll bring this. And my colleague, uh, Dr. Zakir Thomas, he will present the open source drug discovery today to say how open innovation could make a difference. And one of the motive we have, by 75th years of India's independence, you know, even today 1,000 Indian will die in tuberculosis like malaria, can we bring down this death to 1,000 per day to 100 per day? And I, I see Peter sitting here with a similar mission, and I'm sure uh, with the dynamism that you showed as United Nations, if we can put all this together, I think we, should, we can achieve this through an open source uh, drug discovery initiative. With this award, I would just thank Sham for your patronage. Thank you. Uh, we are lucky to have our German speaker here. I believe he made it. So delighted to have you here. Before we close, we would like to hear you. Uh, Professor Dr. Engineer Hans Jörg Bullinger, the floor is yours, sir.
Thank you very much. First of all, I have to apologize that I'm being late, but the reason was we had a conference in Bangalore with the Fraunhofer organization where we opened the day before our office in Bangalore. So I feel it's really an honor to be with you here and talking about innovation. I think innovation is always very important for our whole life in all aspects. But this time we are more or less take, talking and are concentrated about innovation in our industries. And I got the information that I should try in some minutes to explain a little bit about the innovation system in Germany. If you allow me, then I may perhaps start with something that I think was a really good result about the innovation policy in the last decade in Germany. I think you all have looked uh, on the last big crisis which we have had in the economy also in Europe and Germany came out fastest out of that innovation crisis. This has had, of course, several reasons, but I think uh, two main aspects are discussed and are very important. One aspect was that we never believed that you can have a, a country who only relies on service industries and banking, so we still have had a certain force in manufacturing. And the second aspect was that our companies didn't stop to invest in innovation, even in the biggest crisis. So I could tell a simple example how we have uh, saw that that was the correct way. You know, Fraunhofer is a research organization. We are only founded to one third. Two thirds comes from our contract research with industry. And in a crisis in 2008 and 2009, we hired additionally 3,000 people. That would have been never possible when not the industry and our clients are also mainly industries in the medium-sized industry, would have stopped innovation in that time. No, it was the other way around. They said, if we want to overcome the problem, then we have to invest in innovation. The innovation system overall in Germany is from a helicopter perspective not so different to other countries. We have universities, they have the teaching task, they have the task in basic and fundamental research, and we have institutes standing behind the universities in a different way connected with the universities. So, for example, the oldest of those institutions is the Max Planck Society. So if somebody wants to win a Nobel Prize, it's much better to go to Max Planck than to the Fraunhofer organization. Max Planck, uh, we have a similar same size. We are a bit larger as far as uh, number of employees and budget are concerned. So Max Planck is, of course,